Good evening, my name is Robert Fu Wen Lo, Director General of Taipei Economical and Cultural Office in Houston. Thank you for joining us tonight to enjoy this wonderful concert. Music can relieve stress and create happiness. I hope the following 15 minutes will bring you happiness, friendship, and fiber energy. Thank you very much. Antonin de Brozac, a Czech composer who was one of the most prolific chamber music composers of the late 19th century. He held the position of director of the National Conservatory in New York. And his string quartet in F major, The American, was composed in 1893 when he accepted the invitation to spend the summer in the Midwest town of Spillville, Iowa. The tiny farming community of Czech immigrants preserves the language, the culture, and customs of their native land, provided the Dvorak within, within environments he loved the best. He then set to work immediately, and within a very short time, he completed the string quartet, which has later become one of his most beloved chamber works. We are very delighted to open the program with his first movement of the string quartet, The American.
Joseph Suk was a violinist and composer. Um, he was Bohemian and a student of Dvořák. His music was deeply um, influenced by Dvořák's music. He often writes music as lament for the dead, including this elegy. So the elegy for piano trio was, was originally written for solo violin and solo cello and ensemble, and it was rewritten in 1902 for this uh, piano trio format. And the mood of the piece reflects a graceful nostalgia with sudden intrusion of sorrow and painfulness. So without further ado, here is the elegy for piano, violin, and cello.
So this next work we're sharing with you is Snapshot 1909 by John Corigliano for String Quartet. So this work has a really beautiful story behind it, um, and it's also a little gem in my opinion. Um, so the work was inspired by an old photograph of John Corigliano's father, and here's the photograph. So this is actually John Corigliano's father, uh, John Corigliano Sr. And he was uh, playing the violin here. And next to him was his older brother, the father's older, older brother. So that's the uncle of the composer. And this old photo was when his father was about eight years old. And um, as we know, um, or maybe, maybe you are learning for the first time that John Corigliano, his father um, was a, a giant in the music world as well, was a concert master of New York Philharmonic for a very, very long time. And so in this photo, the significance is that we know Corigliano has written lots of really great works for violin and, and we all treasure the, the amount of understanding he has for the instrument. And, um, and that understanding really comes from the fact that he grew up with violin playing in his home. He heard his father practice, practice difficult passages and, and beautiful things. So in a way, we feel like he really connects to us how to, how to write for string instruments because this is what he had at home growing up. I mean, this is before him growing up, but this photo um, inspired the work to be in two parts. The first half, the second violinist is this young boy that plays to this very simple angelic melody. And then while the uncle uh, being played by the first violin and cello and viola, and we're just strumming like guitar. And this young boy is playing a very innocent melody, but, um, but we know that in the future, that this young boy was going to become a giant, an, an incredible virtuoso. So the second half of the piece that you hear the first violin come in in this super high, almost like a Mars kind of place on the, on the violin, and it plays the same melody, but almost like a reminiscence, as if it's like a, either a dream, hope, or maybe it's about um, the future, like projecting a brilliant future. And so this work, inspired by this photo, I think it, it is so special and it's, um, I'm very lucky that it's not my first time playing this piece, and um, I'm very excited to share with you. And I, I think you can hear just the inspir inspiration that John Corigliano had and the admiration he had for his father and seeing this photo, someone who was going to become his huge inspiration as a young boy right here. It's just absolutely amazing story, and I hope you enjoy the work. Thank you. 
Our next selection is a movement of the piano quintet by the trailblazing American composer and virtuoso pianist Amy Beach. She was the first successful female composer of large-scale art music and one of the first uh, most successful American composers who was trained entirely in America without the benefit of European training. Um, all the more remarkable for the uh, institutionalized sexism and barriers that she faced uh, during her lifetime. Uh, for example, she only received the most minimal compositional training as a girl. Uh, most of her training as an adult was actually self-directed. She collected uh, every treatise, every uh, manual on composition that, that she could find, and her quest for knowledge was largely self-driven. Also, for most of her life, at least while married, uh, she was barred from stage performing. It was only after she went to Europe in 1910, after her husband's death, that she was able to reinvent herself uh, and uh, her career as both a pianist as a composer uh, really took off and flourished. Um, she was well known all over Europe and America as a performer and uh, during her lifetime was a highly respected and uh, uh, highly well known composer and performer. Uh, it was only after her death in 1944 that her music began to fall out of fashion largely because it adhered to the older romantic style and didn't sound modern or cutting edge enough. Uh, however, the revival of her works has been very successful in recent decades, uh, which brings us to the piece you're going to hear today, uh, the finale the, or third movement of her piano quintet, which was premiered in Boston in 1909, composed in 1907, then premiered two years later in Boston with Beach herself on the piano. So as you can imagine, there is no shortage of dazzling piano pyrotechnics in this piece. Uh, it's, it, the, the piece runs uh, the incredible emotional and dramatic gamut from, uh, on the one hand, a dark and brooding melancholy, all the way to a feverish, hard on your sleeve, uh, open uh, yearning. And uh, it's an unjustly neglected part of the American, uh, real milestone in the American chamber music canon. We're so happy to be able to present a movement of this piece today, and uh, we hope that hearing the finale of this work will inspire you to check out the whole piece, as well as Amy Beach's other works.
We are very excited to present a quintet that's probably not readily familiar to you. It's called the Highlander Suite, composed by Tyson Xiao, one of the most celebrated composers in Taiwan. It was composed when he was living in Los Angeles in 1985. The Highlander in the title is referring to one of the Aboriginal tribes in Taiwan. The Highlanders are the people who lived mostly in the mountainous area and they had a particularly very rich musical culture, especially vocal music. And the composer collected a lot of those folk materials and incorporated them into this work with some Western musical idioms as well. This piece has four movements and uh, it's essentially a collection, a set of four character pieces. Um, in the first movement, it's called Ami's Folk Song. Ami's is the name of the Aboriginal regional tribe. Uh, we hear this very festive, very earthly dance right away in the beginning. Um, the second movement is called the love story. This is my favorite movement and uh, whenever I listen to this movement I feel like it transports me back to an older time when we didn't have email, when we didn't have text. Um, because in the very beginning we hear this stagnant repeating bass line with the descending, kind of painfully descending chromatic scales, then we hear this very pure, very sincere folk song coming out. And that just reminds me during those times when a couple um, is separated, um, one of them goes out of town or leaves the village, the other one would have to endure months of not hearing from that person and fearing that person would never come back to them. So this piece really captures that waiting, that anxious, bittersweet emotion. Harvest um, is the third movement and it's for string quartet only. Um, this movement, in the beginning, all four instruments uh, played in unison um, as if the farmers are answering the call to go to the field. Very quickly, the texture becomes canonic and fugal as if you know the farmers are very busy working in the field um, in a very happy and um, harvesting season. The last movement is called Allegro, um, and in this piece, the composer introduces a new uh, dancey folk song, very pisante, very, um, very passionate. And in the end, he recycles the opening theme from the first movement, and it's all culminating in an extremely exuberating ending. Um, we hope you will enjoy this work as much as we enjoyed rehearsing and learning this piece.